Angelinos. Kicking off tonight's program is a vital member of the Hollywood community. She is the immediate past chair of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce and the chair of their community foundation. Board member of the California Cultural and Historical Endowment. Member of the Smithsonian National Board and president and founder of the Hollywood Museum. Introducing Danelle Danigan. Hello, Los Angeles, and happy Pride. For eight years, the Hollywood Museum's annual Pride Month exhibit has featured costumes, props, photos, and iconic imagery telling the story of the milestones and influence that LGBTQ plus characters have had in Hollywood, from the earlier stereotypes to modern day representations. This year, the COVID-19 pandemic required the necessary closure of many businesses. The safer at home order and the new social distancing practices saw the Hollywood Museum's doors temporarily close. But in the spirit of pride, it lives on and the closure of the museum would not be the end of the exhibit. This year, the Hollywood Museum, in our continued partnership with Council Member Mitch O'Farrell, salutes the LGBTQ community's contributions to the entertainment industry with tonight's special social distancing edition of our exhibit. While we are unable to gather at the museum, tonight we bring you a slice of the educational, the informative, and the entertaining. We will honor the divinely talented musician Michael Feinstein with the Real to Real Inspiration Award. Later this evening, special guest Kristen Chenoweth drops by to celebrate her dear friend and share a special message with the city. Interviewing these talented stars is council member Mitch O'Farrell. For decades, Mitch has helped steadily maintain the visibility of our diverse communities for a more inclusive Los Angeles. It is of tremendous importance to Mitch that no one, regardless of gender identity, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or religious belief be marginalized in any way. Mitch works with the various organizations to provide services to the LGBTQ plus community and promote advocacy at the local and national levels. Multi-platinum selling and five-time Grammy-nominated recording artist Michael Feinstein is an interpreter of and an anthropologist and archivist for the repertoire known as the Great American Songbook. No stranger to audiences in Los Angeles, we have been enjoying his concerts as principal conductor of the Pasadena Pops since 2012. We've also seen him as presenter on Turner Classic Movies. On behalf of the Hollywood Museum and the historic Max Factor Building, I proudly present to you Real to Real Live Social Distancing Edition. Take it away, Mitch. Michael Feinstein, thank you very much for, for joining us this, for this exciting Real to Real Live. So I wanna to talk to you about your outstanding career in a moment, but first, I want to get your thoughts on the recent events casting a wide shadow across the entire country. Of course, going into the planning of the month of Pride, we had prepared to address the COVID-19 pandemic. And now, with the unrest in the wake of the George Floyd murder, uh, and it goes without saying that the Black experience in America, whether gay or straight, is very different than ours. But we do know that it took an uprising against police brutality at the Stonewall Inn in New York in 1969, which galvanized our very own and very diverse community uh, and fight for equality. And that protest was led by a trans black woman. So uh, let me ask you, Michael, as a first question, how, how can the queer experience from your perspective help with today's activism? Well, the world is so um, extraordinarily different now because of the virtual world as we are communicating. And that gives us a certain power that we didn't have previously that can work uh, in many ways, mighty and fearful and positive and negative. And I think that the um, ability for people to connect and to join forces is extraordinary. Uh, as far as the uh, experience, the, as you say, the queer experience, 
Um, I, I knew Larry Kramer, and uh, one of the things that always impressed me about him is that he was thought of as this bulldog and a very fearsome man because of uh, his screaming and yelling and such, but he actually was a pussycat of a human being. And he understood that he had to get attention because people simply weren't paying attention. And when they did start paying attention, he was a very reasonable, calm, smart, wonderful guy who had the ability to communicate the message. And I think that's what's happening now. People just have to pay attention. We just have to get everybody's attention and then get them to listen. So I, I, I can't possibly put myself uh, in the experience of a person of color. I've had my own experiences, but there's no way that I can feel what they are feeling. And yet I do know that the common human experience, we all cry out for the same thing from our hearts. Right. Yeah, it's, it's an unprecedented time. And I share that with my staff, the vast majority of whom are much younger than I, and I'm old enough to remember um, all of the civil rights, uh, you know, watershed moments of the 1960s and how this is equally impactful that we're is experiencing right now. And it, that's not lost on me either. Um, we're also experiencing a pandemic, something else that this community is very familiar with. So how, how have you been with through all of this and your, your time, your day to day and living amidst, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and these past few months? How has that affected you? What's going on with you in relation just to the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I believe that everything happens for a reason and from tragedy, goodness can come, good can come from it. I think one of the things that has happened for me that has happened for many people is that we now have a lot of time where we have to look at ourselves in a way and on a level that uh, hasn't ever happened before. Because not only do we have the solitary experience of having to look inside and to deal with our emotions and our feelings. And it's like everything that we've avoided in our lives can not possibly come up now. And a lot of people who are uh, coupled and married are getting divorced or having big issues. I mean, everything is coming up. So to me, that's a good thing because we, we have this experience where we have to look inside. And for me, most days I do pretty well. And there are certain days where I, I feel uh, depressed and then I have to meditate more and connect to spirit and to be uh, in the moment. Uh, the other part of it, of course, is that it's the only time in our history that I can think of that the entire world is experiencing. I mean, every soul in the entire world is experiencing exactly the same thing everywhere. And so that gives us a common human connection that when I go outside to take a walk and I see people, I feel a different sort of connection. It's, it's different and it will be different. And so I choose to look at the gifts that will come from this when we get, God willing, past the death and the tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? The convergence of dynamics. And you mentioned how the isolation, whether we like it or not, it forces us, I think, to just do some reflecting that you can't avoid, or perhaps we've been avoiding it to a degree. And mix that with the fact that we have a lot of time on our hands and we're doing a lot of thinking. Mm -hmm. I think that dynamic feeds into the stark um, and horrific crime that we witnessed with the murder of George Floyd, you know? And I just think that the two dynamics are in, in, a, in a sense, giving space to one another so that we can really feel that uh, as never before uh, also, which is very powerful. And, and it's going to change the world, I'm, I, I'm sure of it. Uh, in terms of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, your, your career also, I mean, so much is on hold, but so tell us how that's affected your, your planned, uh, some of your, your planned career uh, next steps with this isolation and pandemic plans what are plans <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> uh, 
it, it's, it's fascinating because all these people that are making predictions about this and that, nobody knows. What we do know is that anything can change in a moment. Something can happen in the news right now that will shift everything again on a global level. So I have learned you can't plan. You can hope and you can say, I'm, this is what I hope for, but we, we can't plan. Uh, most of my engagements uh, have, have been canceled through, through the year. There are some things in the fall that may or may not happen. I, I don't know. Uh, in the interim, I'm working on music and spending time uh, doing creative things that I haven't been able to do otherwise. Even sitting down at the piano and sometimes just playing for fun and playing in keys that I'm not comfortable playing in. So just trying to do stuff to, to uh, use the time and also not to, to do anything with the time, uh, to, to, to veg. Uh, but entertainment is needed more now than ever. And uh, people say, oh, well, what's gonna happen with live entertainment? It will continue and it'll be even more precious. And the appreciation for different kinds of music will become more precious. Just as one of the interesting phenomenons of this uh, isolation has been that the popularity of classical music, people downloading it and listening to it online, has skyrocketed because that is something that feeds the soul. And, and so uh, there's surprises that come from all this. And, and the bottom line is that art will continue. It will respond to what is happening and we will all uh, create in different ways. Right, it's, it's as though a power that we have no control over just, just reached in and pushed the pause button on all of our lives and said, deal with it. Uh, it it's, it's, just, it's very, very interesting. Um, switching, pivoting to a different uh, subject that's totally related to this. You know, when we, when my team and I set out to uh, lay the groundwork and, and put a program together for a month long uh, list of festivities for Pride Month, it's the 50th year of the very first permitted gay pride parade in, in the United States, which happened in Hollywood, which I represent. And so we were reflecting on themes. And so we landed on pride and pandemic. And you and I are of what I call the AIDS generation. We came of age as young men, right when what was then termed a gay cancer, you remember that term from back in the day, and it decimated our community. And by the time we even had a name for it, so many of our friends, uh, lovers, friends, uh, family members had gone. Uh, in, by the millions, even by the time there was testing and there was an actual clinical name for it. So all, all we knew was that it was something called the gay plague. So as, as someone who lived through that, coming of age through it like I did, how do you view the similarities? And, and I, I've always felt that we have something that we can, we can provide. We, can, we have something to give, something to add to this conversation because uh, I remember being very young, seeing my friends at 21 years old dying suddenly thinking, well, I probably won't make it to 25 years either. I'm probably doomed to just like seemingly everyone else. I remember feeling that and accepting that. So that has shaped who I am as a person. And I, I just think that we can give voice to that with what we're going through now. What, what are some of your thoughts in relation to that experience that you had? I um, think a lot about why I'm alive. How I was lucky enough to survive. Yeah. Because I shouldn't have, but I did. Mm -hmm. So that's purposeful. And when we're given the opportunity of life, you can't waste it. I have hope. This is different. This is a different sort of a disease, a different um, situation. And I understand the fear. I understand the fear very, very well, because I went through a lot of it. And the lesson for me was constantly going back to, I'm okay right now. I'm all right. In this moment, I'm okay. And so many people are projecting so many things that are 
destroying them. And we have to focus on what we have. We have to focus on the things in our soul that will build us up. We have to focus on what we want the world to be because we have control over nothing else except what we think and what we feel. That we have control over. We can't change the world, but every action that we take causes a reaction. And so that is what we have to focus on. I, have, I am so conscious of looking at the world in terms of thinking of healing, visualizing change, visualizing what I want. Because if I'm not looking at that, then I'm contributing energy to the opposite of that and creating exactly what I don't want. You know, Michael, that is so beautiful. And I think that you, you, you reached that moment, that, that source that I think we have to offer people. I just know from my own experience, I remember being 21 and facing my mortality right then and there, right when I was coming of age. And then through that experience, taking things one day at a time and looking for joy and looking for friendship and really taking advantage of the pleasures of life that others weren't given, the privileges that, that others weren't given, there is a survivor, a survivor issue there for a lot of us. And I, I think what that did to me over the years is, is that's through that realizing mortality at a very young age, that's what has provided my faith, which interestingly enough, through that experience, I gained faith, um, faith in humanity, faith in people, and a profound sense of responsibility that all of these countless souls that didn't get to be as privileged as I am are depending on me to do something. And I, I, I that really sort of elevates me and it, it sustains me and fortifies my spirit, literally. The spirits of others fortify my spirit. And I, I think that's a gift as well. So I don't wanna go on too much about that because what you said was so beautiful. And I thank you for that. I thank you so much for that, for opening up and being vulnerable. It's really beautiful. And you know, that's, that's who we are. Um, now we're gonna, we're gonna lift it up here a, a second because I wanna talk about your incredible career. And you know, you, you grew up in the Midwest and you developed a keen ear for music and an appreciation for the classics and the Gershwin sound. And uh, what, after graduating high school and you moved to the city to pursue your passion uh, with, and your interest in the most famous lyricists of the 20th century. So how did that, when you moved to LA and you traveled the world and you, you started you know, on your career, how did, uh, that experience, your new experience, inform your pre-existing abilities uh, of writing music. I moved to Los Angeles when I was 20 years old. And that, of course, uh, as you said, was a very important time in, uh, in, in anyone's life. And so I came to Hollywood at a time when um, there were a lot of classic songwriters and performers and stars alive and so i was lucky enough to have a connection to part of hollywood history that um, i treasure and it changed the way i was able to make music because when i was growing up as a kid in columbus ohio i i fell in love with classic songs old songs of the gershwins and irving berlin and cole porter and and I'd never met anyone connected with them. And then I came here and I met all these people who wrote these songs and people who sang them and made the films. And they taught me, they taught me how to interpret these songs. They taught me everything I know. This moving here and then working for Ira Gershwin, who was the great lyricist uh, of these songs and uh, was 80 years old when I met him. I was 20, he was 80. That was my education of learning how to interpret these songs. And so I carry forward what they gave me because for me, music and art is a continuum. And to be able to pass on uh, this art form uh, is something I love. And when I was singing these songs at the age of 20, 
I was already out of step with everything because it wasn't pop music, it wasn't contemporary music, it was something so uh, different, and yet it spoke to me. And I discover that there are always people, young people, who relate to very specific things musically and artistically that is their personal expression. And so it's my desire to make this music available so they can listen to it and discover it and see if it resonates with their heart. So my, my life wouldn't be anything near what it is now if I hadn't come here. Yes, what, what, uh, what a beautiful journey and magical, right? Do you look back at those years and think, that it's somewhat magical that you ended up working for Ira Gershwin at, at age 80 and that influence it had on you? Yeah, it was all, the entire experience from the moment I came to California, it was one thing after another leading to another, meeting Ira Gershwin by coincidence. I mean, the experiences, it, it all just, one thing happened after another and it felt so much to me like it was supposed to happen for whatever reason. and. Uh, I realize now, e even more now, how extraordinary it, it was because it was just kind of wild how one thing led to another. Because I came here, I knew nobody. You know, I, I somehow created myself. And that's yeah. what you can do in Hollywood. <laughs> that's right. Isn't that beautiful in Los Angeles? You're expected, you're expected to reach your potential. It's in the ether here. You're encouraged to do that. And that's a, a beautiful thing about our culture. And I want to do everything I can to keep that, that going. It's we're here from all over the world, myself as well, not from here, but moved here at 21. Um, yeah. and, I've, and I've always, from Oklahoma City, and I've always felt that the forces push us to just go for it here. And it's not like that in other places. I, I can't ex ex explain that exactly. That's one of the beauties of LA. Um, so will you tell us a little bit about your, your nonprofit organization, uh, The Great American Songbook? Yes, uh, I created the Great American Songbook Foundation in, uh, oh Lord, I think 2007. And the reason I created this organization was to uh, keep alive the music that I love as I saw it uh, start to wane and disappear with the changing of generations. And uh, I've collected through the years uh, incredible uh, musical artifacts, memorabilia and orchestrations and recordings and all kinds of stuff that I started thinking, well, where's this gonna go when I die? And I realized that there's no museum anywhere for American popular song. We have a rock and roll hall of fame, we have a country music a hall of fame, uh, the Experience Music Project. So it, it's my, it was my intention to create a place, a physical place where there can be a museum to celebrate the songbook and also uh, to have uh, annual programs with uh, high school kids to teach mm -hmm. them about the songbook. So uh, we've had these songbook academies for several years and it's been life-changing for these kids who sometimes come from very uh, humble economic situations and this music is their lifeline. You know, they they uh, a lot of times learn about classic music from uh, choir in school or, or uh, uh, musical theater where they'll do a show or something. but. Music can change lives. Music can change lives. And uh, so the Great American Songbook Foundation exists to, to change young people's lives. And also we do work with um, people with dementia and Alzheimer's. We started a program called Perfect Harmony because the elders are one of the um, greatest underserved communities. And when I came to Los Angeles, I started playing in convalescent homes several times a week just to connect with old people. And uh, that's another thing that's important to me, especially as I move closer and closer to getting uh, to that age. <laughs> Here, here's what I gather from speaking with you. You've put out so much good karma that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's coming back to you. That's, that's, what I, that's what I'm sensing from you. That's, that's great. That's a beautiful, beautiful organization. And what a legacy you've already left. And you've got so much more life. So that's really something. Congratulations on that. Thank you, Mitch. So I have a question before we, uh, I think we have someone very special to introduce soon, but what, what can we expect next from uh, Michael Feinstein? I'm just completing a recording called Gershwin Country. That's du Gershwin standards sung with, as duets with country artists. 
because I discovered that the Gershwin canon uh, really works well with the Nashville band and these songs sound organic interpreted with uh, Nashville musicians and steel guitar so I recorded in Nashville and recorded duets with with uh, Brad Paisley and and Dolly Parton and and uh, Allison Krauss and Roseanne Cash uh, uh, it, it's it's a recording that I'm very proud of so that'll be coming out uh, whenever uh, the powers that be deem is the best time. Everyone's trying to figure out when do, how do we release a record, you know? Uh, but that, that'll be coming out. Uh, and uh, then I'll also resume next year, continuing uh, my conducting of the Pasadena Pops and and touring. So, but the big thing for me next is the, is the recording Gershwin Country. So exciting, I can't, I cannot wait. That, that's really cool. Um, all right, well, now's the, come the time uh, that we're gonna introduce a very special guest. Uh, someone that uh, that I admire so much, and I had the great honor to meet a couple of years back. Uh, and I understand this person is a really great friend of yours and an admirer uh, in your universe of admirers. Uh, and that is none other than the spectacular, amazing, talent, beautiful person that she is, Kristen Chinoweth. Walk with me. See, I'm just, just trying to teach you the thing that really counts. How to be me. Oh, oh, Carlene, can you, are you, honey, calm down. It's happening again. What? You cut me from the cheer squad because I have bad skin, and now you're making me play the leper? Anyone who tries to stand in C.J. Craig's shoes will be eaten alive. And who exactly do you think is going to brief the press? You. How about being grounded till you're 18? How about that? Fine, if that means you'll be normal parents. Normal? Jamie, are you a stay-at-home mom? Yes. I mean, without a fail. Let me hook you up with Happy Max. I got a rep bag in the bus. Oh. Plus, I represent lovely Lily Beauty Product. Like you have divorced. Because I don't want to. Isn't that setting a bad example to women everywhere to be such a doormat? Hey, listen, I can't get up. Jackson is very gassy and I gotta keep bouncing him soul poop. Oh, okay. Uh, well, this is Brad. Hi. Hi. I'm Courtney. I'm a vice principal. It's my job. Whatever. So what a surprise I found when we didn't have your transcripts from your old school, so I called them. <laughs> Sorry about that. I used to do a little modeling, mostly for art classes at the community college. <laughs> That's how I met Buddy. Really? Was he an artist? Nah, they caught him peeking in through the windows. <laughs> There she is. I can't believe it. <laughs> Hello, my darling. <laughs> we invite you to say whatever you'd like about this remarkable man that we're honoring today. First of all, go back in time to 88. I'm at Oklahoma City University, and everybody is talking about him. And I thought, if one day I could meet him, then I'll have made it. So literally, the day that I met him, he doesn't remember this, but long, long time ago, I told him that story and he was like, well, we're here, you know? And that just kind of, for me, was a full circle moment. One of the things I really want to speak to that's very, very important that I feel, of course, we know he's a five-time Grammy nominee. We know he's had specials, uh, especially his Frank Sinatra um, that aired at, in Carmel, Indiana, that was that was also Emmy nominated. He is an incredible, incredible musician, mentored by one of the greatest, Ira Gershwin. But what I want to speak to Michael about, why I think he deserves this incredible award, um, is that he's a mentor to so many who uh, want to be him. And not only want to be him, but want to make music better. And there's a specific story that I have that Michael, I'm gonna tell. So we were in, I can't remember the town, I've got COVID brain, but the town, and I was getting to watch Michael mentor a student. 
And he kept talking about phrasing. When you're a musician, uh, you talk about the musicality and you talk about phrasing and how important the lyrics, the melody. And I remember him saying, a lot of people can sing, but it's the melody and, the, and uh, it's the lyric that stands out. And what I garnered and what I took from it, which I've used at, for, for myself. So you see, he inspired me too. And he said, only sing what you mean and phrase it correctly how you would phrase it and to me in especially in these times sing it the way you would say it and only sing what you mean and michael has been doing that since the beginning of his career and that that is why he has touched so many that is why he continues to mentor those not just like me but those way younger than me and that's why his legacy especially especially in his theater will continue on i've been to the, his theater and performed there and met his kids uh that are there myself. And I know what good he is putting into this world. So Michael, from me to you, you have inspired generations and you will you have much more work to do, especially with me, but you have much more work to do and um, I know you will do it. I'm very proud to call you my friend. You deserve this award of what I feel is truly inspiration. And uh, God bless you, sweetheart. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love you and I appreciate you so much for everything that you have done for so many. I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, have this moment with you. Thank you. That was a beautiful tribute, Kristen Chinoweth. Um, I think you and, and Michael share something. You, Your beauty of spirit and your generosity of spirit just shines through in everything you do. So I think it's very fitting that Michael Feinstein with his 30 plus year career, uh, giving inspiration to legions of admirers across the world uh, deserves this inspiration award. Uh, and I wanna thank the Hollywood Museum and annual Reel to Reel exhibit. It'll be a virtual exhibit this year. Uh, and uh, Michael, you're just making it that much more special. And Kristen, with uh, your lovely tribute uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful moment. And uh, we congratulate you, Michael. And we thank you, Kristen, for sharing those beautiful words about Michael Feinstein with all of us. And Mitch, of course, well said, sir. But before I stop talking, I wanted y'all to see if we weren't in a virtual situation, if we would have been able to do this in person, I wanted y'all to see what shoes I would have worn. And I think it's very important at this point to show, first of all, he is, you know, the master of all things Judy, all things Liza. And when I bought these, which I had to pray about because, you know, they weren't, you know, but I just want to say, Michael, these are my Liza shoes, my Judy shoes, and I would have worn them. That's what I want to have, but instead I have on flip flops. But yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You are my Judy and my Liza. <laughs> And so we'll write a rain check for those shoes because you'll be putting them on for a, a, a future time uh, when we can celebrate Mr. Yes. Stein in person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you all so much. Happy Pride in these incredible times we're in. Any last words of wisdom, inspiration about the times that we're going through right now? Hey, me? Sure. Uh I sure, yeah, absolutely. A lot of times Michael will, it seems to, he always, I think he has ESP or something because he always gives me like these little things right when I need them. But um, one, thing, one of the things I just want to say is love big and love loud. Actually love bigger and love louder than you ever have before. That's my, that's my, that's what I'm going to do. That's beautiful and it's a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, blessings and love to both of you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure and I have nothing but gratitude for all that you've done and all you're doing and the incredible talents that you've been sharing with the world all these years. We, we all thank you. Oh, thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Mitch. We love you too, yeah. Mitch. Michael, I love you. I love you too.
What an enlightening and entertaining conversation. On behalf of the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor Building and Council Member Mitch O'Farrell, we would like to offer our congratulations to Michael Feinstein for receiving the 2020 Real to Real Inspiration Award. And we want to give special thanks to Kristen Chenoweth for adding her one-of-a-kind brand of class and warmth to this exciting celebration. The Hollywood Museum commits to providing a safe space to learn and admire Hollywood history. Council Member O'Farrell and I hope you enjoyed this presentation of Real to Real Live. Happy Pride, Los Angeles. Until next time. <laughs>